us to guide us in our discussions. In the name of God, we pray. You may take your seats. Uh, honorable ministers, the Minister of State for ESC, uh, Honorable James Magode Ikuya, Honorable Henry Msasizi, Minister of State for General Duties, the Minister of Finance, Planning and Economic uh, Development, members of parliament from all the different uh, parliaments, uh, the organizers of this event. Ladies and gentlemen, we are running one hour late, so we'll try to be faster in our conversations. We want to welcome you to this East African Community ESC post-budget dialogue on tax and debt. Uh, organized by Siatini URA, Miaka, the Minister for East African Affairs, and others as we'll go through uh, them. I want to take this opportunity. Uh, Fred Mhumza is my name, just in case you have forgotten or you thought I had changed the names. And I'll be taking you through the session as a moderator, but not as um, the main speaker for the day. We'll be told how the sessions are going to run. So at this point, I want to invite Madam Jane Nalunga, the Executive Director, Siatini, Uganda, to come and welcome us and maybe tell us what areas she has for us. Madam Jane Nalunga. Um, Honorable James Magode Ikuya, a Minister of State for East African Community Affairs, representing the first Deputy Prime Minister, Minister of ESC Community Affairs, Honorable Henry Musa Sizi, Minister of State for General Duties, Minister of Finance, Planning and Economic Development, Honorable Members of Parliament here, um, directors, commissioners from government, um, the civil society fraternity here, private sector, the force estate. I also would like to give a special recognition to the various national budget mass partners, including Minister of uh, Finance, URA, and the Minister of, Minister of ES Affairs. Um, distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we also have some participants online. I would also like to welcome you all uh, to this third edition of the East African Community Financial Year 2023-2024 Post-Budget Dialogue on Tax and Debt. Uh, this dialogue is, um, is organized under the same building resilient economies, tax harmonization, and debt sustainability for a thriving East Africa. The specific objectives of this dialogue are to understand the various measures passed by the East African Community Council of Ministers in the financial year 2023-24, and their implication on reg the regional integration process and on the trade within the region. It will also, we also like to equip citizens with a relevant knowledge and information on tax, debt, trade, and other fiscal related issues to inspire informed debates and effective citizens participation in the regional integration process. Um, we also want to heighten transparency and accountability in mobilization allocation and utilization of public resources, not just in our partner states, but also in the East African region. This dialogue is also providing a platform 
for different stakeholders across the East African region to discuss revenue mobilization, utilization, and accountability processes and uh, practices. And we hope that at the end of this dialogue, we can collect recommendations on how decisions and policy making processes on tax measures and other development issues in the East African region can be harmonized to promote equitable and fair taxation, but also development, inclusive development across the region. Uh, honorable uh, ministers, the ESC envisions attaining a prosperous, competitive, secure, and politically united East African community. In the quest to achieve this um, objective, one of the significant events that takes place annually within the East African region is the presentation of the national budgets by the finance ministers of each partner state at the same time, although some two partner states were not ready. This occurs in June and in July as new as a new financial year kicks off for the majority of the East African partner states. This was part of the resolution in 2007, where the East African partner states agreed to harmonize their budgets, their budget reading, as part of the efforts towards harnessing regional integration, demonstrating that when the budgets are not read together, there was a fear and that there will be a risk of policy le leaks and unfair business. One of the recurrent priorities of the one of the recurrent priorities of the ES budget process was to harmonize fiscal and monetary policies towards the attainment of the East African Monetary Union. It should be noted from the budgets of the partner states that all the partner states have increased their budgets for the, this financial year, the coming financial year. However, the revenue collected in the East African countries still not commensurate with the increasing expenditure needs in the partner states. We have also noted the low revenue collection and unfulfillment of the commitment made by the ESC partner states to increase, to attain the tax to GDP ratio of 25%. Therefore, this discussion, this dialogue. We also dialogue on how uh, to, address, to address that challenge. Therefore, the dialogue provides a platform for the citizens in the East African partner states to understand the ESC budget for the financial year 2023-24, engage with the various policy makers on how to foster and strengthen regional integration through harmonization and public debt management, but also strengthening how we can be able to strengthen trade, to strengthen the regional integration, um, regional integration uh, process. Let me conclude, ladies and gentlemen, by saying that we can and should make the East African regional integration process work for the people, for us, the people, the business community, and also the planet. Thank you, and thanks again to the National Budget Mass Partners, especially the ministries of um, Finance, Ministry of ES Affairs, to ensure that you know, we work together, the citizens, civil society, and the private sex sector. I thank you so much, and thank you so much for coming. Thank you, Madam Jen Nalunga, for the welcome remarks. Uh, you just need to know that we are live on Smart TV, NTV, URA TV, YouTube, and there's a hashtag ESC Budget 23.
And for that matter, you need to be conscious walking in front of these cameras. Those of you who are walking, you need to find a way of either bending, just in case somebody you have been hiding from sees you that you are here. And we are here for three hours, so they will have enough time to come and find you. So respect the cameras there because they are broadcasting live, including to Ukraine. Uh, let me invite um, Madam Irene Mulika, Assistant Commissioner Customs, Uganda Revenue Authority. And your UR ATV people are going to watch you. It's good accountability. They might be thinking she's not in office and she's having fun at the golf courses here for these important issues. Thank you. Honorable Minister, Minister of State for East African Af Affairs, Honorable Minister of State for General Duties, Ministry of Finance, Planning and Economic Development, Honorable MPs, Executive Director, Siatini, and all distinguished guests here today, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Um, I stand here uh, representing the Commissioner Customs, Uganda Revenue Authority, and I've, as I have been introduced, I'm Irene Malika, Assistant Commissioner Trade, Uganda Revenue Authority. Um, following the theme, the topic for today, perceptions on maximizing taxa taxation and managing public debt for inclusive growth and sustainable development in East Africa. Under the budget theme for the East African community, building resilient economies, tax harmonization, and debt sustainability for a thriving ESC. As URA, our chief mandate is to collect taxes, assess them, and to collect them enough toward uh, our contribution towards the domestic revenue mobilization drive is to collect enough tax and non-tax revenue, sufficient enough to finance Uganda's national budget and free Uganda from economic dependency. I will therefore concentrate on what URA is going to do as one of the partner states under the ESC to support the domestic revenue mobilization drive. Our domestic revenue target for the next financial year, 2023-2024, is 29.7 trillion. And this, when collected, will translate to a revenue effort of 14.3% tax to GDP ratio. That is our aim as URA. How are we going to achieve this? As URA, we are going to achieve this through various revenue measures. And these are to strengthen tax administration compliance and enforcement. Some of the measures that we are going to take uh, have already been shared extensively, but uh, nonetheless, I'll go through them again. One is that we have the technology advancement drive, and out of that, we have the enhanced implementation of the electronic physical receipting and invoicing system called IFRIS, in short. We have heard about it, but this IFRIS is supposed to issue invoices and you're supposed to get e-receipts whenever you trade in goods and whenever you deal, buy and sell. So URA is promoting that. That one is to enhance acquisition of real-time information on these transactions and also to help the traders and taxpayers to have better records because you straight away know what you're contributing to URA and in a way you'll find it easier to file returns. The other measure that we are continuing with is implementation of the digital tax stamps. These digital tax stamps are a marking that is applied to goods or their packaging and contain security features and codes which identify these goods. They prevent them, from, uh, they enable us to differentiate them from counterfeit goods and they enable the owners of the goods to track and trace them. So, this means digitalization of your production processes and uh, the stamps are issued on particular goods that are gazetted. 
Some of them are like soft drinks, soda, water, beer, cigarettes, cement, and the list goes on. We are also improving our service delivery to our clients. As URA, we are not just an authority, but we are a revenue service body. And we believe that in continued service delivery, improvement in service delivery to all our taxpayers, it shall enhance voluntary compliance. And in that way, we shall collect more revenue. So some of the options that we are doing is to ease payment of taxes and the technologies that are being deployed. For example, we have the USSD quick code. This is an unstructured supplementary service data called a quick code. It is like an easier way of paying using your phone. You just press star, um, star 285 hash, and then the menu will come up, and you select according to what taxes you want to pay. Even border border riders can use that. Um, then, of course, you can pay electronically using the Visa and MasterCards. And, of course, also using mobile money. We have options for payment of taxes using mobile money. Say, if you dial star 185 hash, you'll be able to pay your bills, your taxes. And, of course, under the electronic, IFRIS, electronic fiscal receipting and invoicing system, we have also the electronic physical devices that we are issuing out and that are used to also issue these e-invoices. The other measure that we are taking are measures to curb growth of tax areas. As URA, we continue to engage with our taxpayers. And one of the measures that we are taking on is the alternative dispute resolution. This is a method where we call upon our taxpayers to come and engage with us and we settle tax disputes harmoniously. And it is preferred wherever you have an objection with URA and you've exhausted the objection process, it is preferred that you come to URA and we sit at this round table and resolve it using an alternative dispute mechanism. It will avoid delays that we all face when we go to court and the costs that come with the court cases and the lengthy processes. In this regard also, just like the Honorable Minister of Finance announced in the budget speech, um, under the Tax Procedures Code Act, it has been amended to waive any interest and penalty on tax areas outstanding as at 30th June 2023. So we are calling upon our dear taxpayers, those who have tax areas outstanding, to come up and pay the principal taxes now. Please use this window. The provision is limited to taxpayers who shall pay their principal taxes by 31st December 2023. And this measure is also to help in the recovery from the impact of COVID and of course the other crises that have happened in this world, like the Ukraine-Russia war. We shall continue to collaborate as URA with all other government agencies and with our dear stakeholders through sharing of information, data integration, uh, integration of our systems, analyzing data to identify and register all eligible uh, persons who should be registered for tax payment. Some of the bodies we are collab collaborating with are like Uganda, sorry, Uganda Registration Services Bureau, NIRA, National ID Registration Authority, UBOS, and Kampala City Council Authority, among others. Some of the compliance initiatives that URA is undertaking, first of all, uh, as one of the partner states, and uh, as a URA, we believe in enhancing voluntary compliance more than application of enforcement measures. So it is with that background, upon that background, that we shall continue to enhance voluntary compliance through promotion of the Authorized Economic Operators Scheme. This is a scheme, in, in brief we summarize, we call it AEO, Authorized Economic Operators. It is a regional scheme. It is being run by all the East African partner states. And what it implies is that we call upon the taxpayers to come up and have a partnership with the revenue administrations. We call upon them, we do some 
uh, preliminary checks, uh, those taxpayers who are compliant, and we offer them benefits above the others who are going to go through the whole continuum of the risk management measures. So when these authorized economic operators come, we check their financial systems, we do some checks, and then eventually when they are accredited as AEOs, we give them benefits like faster clearance, they have a choice. If their goods must be examined physically, they choose where they shall be examined from, and they are given priority in all our processes. This is also a trade facilitation measure as one of our objectives to simplify uh, and harmonize our processes and make sure that we spend as much, as little time as possible importing and exporting goods. We shall also have increased engagements and sensitizations of our taxpayers aimed at raising tax awareness and also this will be done in a sector-based approach so that the needs specific to the different sectors are addressed. This will enhance current efforts to build strong and positive relationships between URA and our taxpayers. We are also reaching out. We have a tax outreach campaign. We have two mobile buses. I don't know if some of you have seen them, but they are called to Jenge buses to register and sensitize our citizens on tax matters. So they move around, they are able to move to the different districts of Uganda. And when we move out there, people come up, we educate them, we give them tax information, financial literacy information, and we encourage them to register and pay their taxes. And this is countrywide, it can reach even the remotest areas that we were not able to reach before. So this is going on. And together with this, we have a campaign which we are calling Paris City Angi. And what this means is we are seeking that voluntary compliance. So whenever you buy goods or whenever you sell, issue these electronic receipts that I have talked of before under the IFRIS system. So as taxpayers, as citizens of Uganda, we encourage you that whenever you reach out, we are saying Paris City Yang, we are doing it in a friendly manner so that more and more people can be encouraged and interested in paying their taxes. There are lots of goodies to be won out of this, but the ultimate aim is to enhance voluntary compliance. And then we have improved technologies in customs processes. Uh, I'll mention a few of them. So we, are, we have a technology drive. Um, we are using, we have sets of non-intrusive inspection scanners. At the moment we have 44. These ones aid us in uh, knowing what is in the containers. We don't necessarily have to examine goods physically, and it also helps to fast track clearance of goods. And also, of course, to see any, those, any of the taxpayers who might have been tempted to avoid taxes and conceal goods. It is done regionally. The goods are scanned right from the regions. All the regions in the partner states have scanners. And we are working on sharing our images. That is the way we are going forward so that we'll be able to receive the images once the goods are scanned at the ports. But right now, we all have the scanners at the borders, also for security measures. One of the things we do as URA is that we are also responsible, together with all the other government agencies at the border, to ensure a safe and secure environment for our citizens. Under that technology advancement, we have the single customs territory as the ESC. This means this is to enhance the customs union in which we are, and our customs systems are interconnected. And so we are able to share information as customs in the region, and that has enabled us to have one declaration, customs declaration made at the ports of entry when goods are entering the country and also intra-regionally when they are being exported. And this reduced costs of doing business. The goods that we deal with are also tracked electronically. We have the regional electronic cargo tracking system, and this is also one of the risk management tools. So we attach an electronic seal to the goods, high-risk goods, and we are able to track them throughout the, regions, the region. URA is also planning to use drones going forward. 
drones are going to be used as an alternative measure to monitor, to surveil the various porous borders of Uganda. We are responsible to make sure that everyone pays their fair share of taxes. So for those who have been using the porous borders, other than running after them, yes, we do have intelligence-based fo focus operations, but we shall also use this technology to enhance our efforts. One of the other things we are doing under the electronic single window, electronic single window is one which um, is like a one-stop center when you're declaring a transaction, all the government agencies are under it. And so you're able to put in your declaration once and everyone concerned with it is able to access it once. This reduces costs of doing business, but under it, we are about, we are going to embark on rolling out what we call the advanced rulings program. In this, we mean that we want to, to guide our taxpayers even before the goods reach Uganda, even before the goods are shipped. For as long as you give us the necessary information, we shall issue advance rulings on valuation, on classification, and on rules of origin. This is going to be done to reduce on clearance time so that by the time your goods are reaching us, we have already known what is coming and you know the treatment for it. So that is the mode of operation as customs under URA. It is to do more, deal more with the pre-arrival of goods, do more then and do less when the goods reach the borders. Distinguished guests, those are among some of the first trade facilitative measures that URA is taking. Uh, together with the partner states. And above all, we shall uphold our values of integrity. Our values, core values as URA are professionalism, integrity, and patriotism. Patriotism means we love our country and we shall be professional. We are continuously building staff capacity and of course, uphold our integrity. This, if we do this, together with all your collaboration, we are sure that we are on the right path to economic independence, which is our mandate to collect enough revenue, everyone paying their fair share of taxes to free our country from debt. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Irene Murika, for the information. It is easier to get an, uh, a fresh receipt, not as easy to issue an a fresh invoice when your business is downtown where Buganda, Buganda Pass Park used to be. But the good thing I've received information, URA is on WhatsApp, and whoever is managing that WhatsApp, get warned because I'm about to test you and send you a question and wait to see whether it is working and how long it takes for an inquirer to get a response. I'll use an anonymous number just trying to see whether these things actually work so that I can report to Mulika before we leave here. Honorable Minister Henry Msasizi, I want to invite you to come and address uh, the audience. Honorable Minister. Thank you so much, Dr. Fred Muhumza, for inviting me to this podium. My colleague, Honorable Ikuya, the Minister of State for East African Affairs, the management of Siatini, Uganda, and all our partners in the budget month. The staff from Ministry of Finance, staff from ESC, the heads of government agencies who are here, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. 
Good morning to you all. Since Monday, I have been speaking in these forums. I don't know how many times I have spoken about these things. But I want to appreciate Siatin for one reason. Wherever we have spoken, our emphasis has been what we do internally here. This is the first time I am speaking, I'm going to speak about the regional matters. And the things I'm going to speak about don't even get a chance to be discussed in our parliament here. These are things we do as the ESC region, but whose effect affect us as Ugandans, affect our taxpayers, affect our economy, and also they affect our other stakeholders like the academia who use this information. Therefore, I would like to take this opportunity to thank you for inviting me for this occasion on the post-budget dialogue on the East African community tax matters and the debt strategy for financial year 2023-2024. Let me also thank the organizers and all of you who have spared the time to come and be part of this dialogue including those who, are, who have joined us virtually. These engagements are always welcome. We at the Ministry of Finance, we normally use them to break down the budget and to take the budget to the last mile. This is an opportunity we give to the general public to ask questions about the budget and also we use this opportunity to get feedback about what people think and perceive the decisions we make in the budget and the general macroeconomic management. And this feedback helps us improve on our processes of decision making, considering that every 12 months we go through the process of budgeting. So I want to thank you so much for your participation and I encourage you not to get tired of this repetitive uh, uh, information we keep giving you from in different forums. As government, we will embrace the opportunities to dialogue with civil society and the wider citizenry to increase participation in the process of policy formulation and to better inform policy making. The fiscal strategy for next financial year will prioritize enhancing reven enhance revenue collection and rationalization of public expenditure and ensuring long-term debt sustainability. This will reduce reliance on external financing for social economic transformation. As we earlier informed you in the budget speech, in nominal terms, Uganda's debt to GDP 
is projected to drop to 48.2 percent this financial year ending June 2023 from 46 from 48.6 percent at the end of June 2022. This reduction is due to the government's commitment to debt sustainability. Sometimes when we talk about this, in the public out there, they say we have overborrowed, which is true. We have indeed overborrowed. But if that is the case, the key debate should be on the way forward. Yes, we find ourselves in this situation. We are telling you we are within and sustainably our debt is well controlled. But there are a number of things we need to address going forward. And what we have done, like you heard the President comment on the budget speech, we have enhanced controls in debt approvals. The other day I was here, Professor Augustus Nwagawa said, the question we should ask ourselves is what are we borrowing for? Where are we borrowing from? And when shall we repay this debt and at what interest? These are the key questions we should always ask ourselves. And I think when Maris comes to the, uh, to the panel, she will tell you that uh, we are now beginning to focus more on external borrowing compared to domestic borrowing because the domestic borrowing has a number of risks including the overcrowding effect whereby we have always been accused of competing with the private sector. We are trying as much as possible to, to minimize that. And also domestic borrowing is considerably expensive compared to external borrowing. And also the terms, the external borrowers tend to give us uh, longer terms than the domestic. Uh, render. So uh, this, is, this is one of the strategies we have decided to undertake. Among the many others, we don't borrow for anything. We only borrow to finance productive sectors of the economy, the sectors which bring growth. We don't borrow to eat. We borrow to invest in areas uh, which brings return to the economy. And we think in this way, we shall uh, widen the tax base to enable URA to collect more taxes. We shall grow our economy to bring more jobs we shall add value to our products to make them sell in the world market, etc., etc. Therefore, I want you to be our ambassadors. When people say we have overborrowed, you add the points I have made, and in so doing, we shall win this debate out there, which sometimes become unnecessarily negative. This is slightly below our debt of 48.6% is slightly below the government's policy target of not more than 50% of GDP, 
and also below the 52.4% threshold provided for in the Charter of Fiscal Responsibility as at the end of financial year 2023-2024. Distinguished participants, Uganda being a member of the ESC community, it is required for us to participate in various processes of the community as well as enforce decisions on the community. I will therefore focus on the highlights of the ESC Council of Ministers' decisions for financial year 2023-2024, which have impact, which have direct impact on the budget. And number one is that the budget for financial year 2023-2024 focuses on full monetization of Uganda's economy through commercial agriculture, industrialization, expanding and broadening services, digital transformation, and broadening market access. The East African community has deepened its regional integration agenda. To that end, government will enhance coordination of civil society, public and private sector actors to leverage regional and international cooperation with a view of maximizing all the available market opportunities. We shall therefore closely monitor the non-tariff barriers in the region and ensure that they are well resolved timely to facilitate free movement of goods and services across the borders. I would like to therefore call upon all of you to exploit the benefits of the expanded markets, both the regional and the global level. The East African partner states finalized the comprehensive review of the East African Common Market External Tariff and agreed on a four band structure with a minimum rate of number one, zero percent duty levied on imports of raw materials and capital goods. Number two, 10 percent duty charged on imports of intermediate goods. Number three, 25% duty charged on imports of finished goods not readily available in the region. And number four, a maximum rate of 35% duty charged on imports of finished goods readily available in the region. The implementation of this new ESC common external tariff has already commenced in respect of all products imported into the East African community. The comprehensive review of the common external tariff aims to mitigate distortions in the structure of the current CET and economy. Barriers to intra-regional trade provide higher protection, social welfare issues, and enhance competitiveness of our industries. In other words, we did this to protect our own products from the global competition. We believe in the ESC we have capacity to produce certain things. And the goods we produce must be enabled to compete favorably. And the strategy was to, is to give them favorable, favorable treatment, tax treatment, to enable them competitive. And that is why we came up with this four tariff band 
to categorize products under the four, and this we believe will enable our goods to be more competitive within the region. On the other side, in the budget proposals for the financial year 2023-24, we made modest adjustments in the ESC common external tariff. Uganda was allowed to continue applying import duty rates beyond the tariff bands of 0%, 10%, 25%, and 35% on specific products. The rates are from 25%, 35%, 60% for agricultural products where Uganda has competitive advantage in order to promote import substitution and value addition of our industries by protecting our local producers. In other words, even when there is this agreed upon framework of the four tariff band, we as Uganda where we have more competitive advantage. We managed to put a case and we were allowed to even go beyond this uh, tariff band, the full tariff band, and put, raise the rates even higher than that to protect our goods more where we think we have a competitive advantage. I think this is good news for our local producers. Particularly for meat and the edible meat offer, Potatoes fresh or chilled, other than seed, sausages, and similar products, chewing gum, other sugar confectionary sweets, chocolates, biscuits, honey, ready to drink juices, ginger, jams, processed tea, and the coffee, among others. These are the goods where we have more favorable rates in order to protect them from external competition. In addition, we proposed to extend duty remission for essential raw materials and inputs used by manufacturers in the production process under the ESC duty remission scheme. These inputs are taxed at reduced duty rate of 0%, although the normal duty rates are higher than 0%, usually at 35%, 25%, and 10%. This is aimed at reducing the cost of inputs and hence the cost of doing business in Uganda. Distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen, as you are aware, ESC partner states ratified the agreement establishing the African Continental Free Trade Area, AFCFTA, and are ready to commence trading. This arrangement will bring the following benefits. Number one, is creating a single market for goods and services with free movement of business, business persons and investments and thus pave way for accelerating the establishment of the Continental Customs Union. Number two is expanding intra-African trade through better harmonization and coordination of trade liberalization and facilitation regimes and instruments across regional economic communities and across Africa in general. Number three is expediating the regional and continental integration process. And lastly, number four is enhancing competitiveness at the industry and enterprise level through exploiting opportunities for scale production, continental market access, and better reallocation of resources. I therefore take this opportunity to encourage the private sector to adequately prepare, to take advantage 
of the opportunities under the African continental free trade area. Distinguished participants, in addition, the efforts promote the ESC as an ideal investment destination and attract foreign direct investments. The ESC Secretariat partnered with different institutions to organize investment and business forums scheduled between June and September 2023. These forums include the business summit organized with the African Union Commission planned for 10th to 12th July 2023 in Nairobi, Kenya, and the East African Community Investment and Business Summit in partnership with the EA BC planned for September 2023 in Kampala, Uganda. I therefore call upon you all to participate in the above forums, especially the private sector to leverage on such opportunities for investment. I once again would like to appreciate the organizers for this dialogue. Madam Jen, I really appreciate your partnership. I want to repeat this. When I was still in the Parliament as a chairperson of the Finance Committee in the 10th Parliament, that's where our relationship started from. You supported me then, and you still support me now as Minister of State for Finance and the entire ministry. So on behalf of the ministry, I want to thank you and other partners for working with us in this endless journey of building our economy as Uganda and building our economy as East Africa. To the distinguished participants, thank you for sparing your valuable time to come and attend this dialogue. I want to end by thanking the Minister of East Africa and Affairs, represented by the Minister of State here, for coordinating us in all these initiatives. We are always led well in these meetings by the Right Honorable Rebecca Kadaga and Honorable James Ikuya. They have always provided leadership and we achieved a lot of benefits as Uganda. Let's uh, appreciate them with them. Uh, Thank you so, so much for listening to me, and I wish you fruitful deliberations. Thank you, Honorable Minister. We highly appreciate the remarks you have given to us, but also appreciate the time you have given to us and the history of how your partnership with Siatini has a record to this. We know you, uh, we have to share you with others. So should you find another space where the, you are needed most, we want at this point to allow you when the time comes uh, to go to attend to other constituencies that you have as a minister. Uh, Madam Jane, I'm unable to invite two ministers to speak to us, so I'm going to invite you to invite the minister who is representing. Um, Honorable Minister is going to attend to private sector foundation. You know that is another big constituency that drives this economy and which pays the taxes. So he also needs to go and give them uh, the assurances. Do we need a photograph at this point? I think let us take a quick photograph. Um, 
Honorable Minister, we want to have a photograph which uh, Maris can also attend. Maris, can you please come with the minister for a photograph here? And then we can let him go. We need that record on camera. And uh, I'll invite Jen Mulika, the URA, to come up, Irene Mulika, to come up for the photograph as well. How I wish it was still those cameras with the films. You wouldn't be taking those many. You'd let my ministers go. <laughs> there was a time cameras had films that had either 24 pictures or 36. And at times the film would get finished and you have to reload. By the time you're done, the president has gone. That's technology advancing us to the new levels. Have you greeted your neighbor? Do you know who that neighbor is? Did they sit next to you by coincidence or they were deliberate? Please find out. There might be a business deal and this is the moment to handle that business deal. We are here for a dialogue on tax and debt. Uh, some people may not know the relationship between tax and debt. Uh, there was a gentleman in economics called Ricardo many years ago. He said, no matter how good your investment climate is, investors you are trying to attract first look at the debt of that country. Because they know the only way to resolve that debt is through tax. So when they see a country with a big debt, they don't come. Because they know eventually time is going to come and you will tax them. So there are some of these things that we have in this relationship between tax and debt and the investment by the private sector that we are looking forward to. So it is possible that we have already lost out some investors because of our debt profile and they don't want to come in here since they know we'll pay the debt. But as we resolve it, and how we use it, and that was the message from the minister, how you use the debt matters. You want to use the debt in a way that encourages investments, because those investments will eventually be available to reconcile the, uh, the issues of debt. We have two panels, but I'm going to be privileged to possibly combine those panels, but that is later. We want to first hear the keynote uh, address, which is going to be delivered by the Honorable Minister of State for East African Affairs, um, Honorable James Magode Ikuya, when he comes back, which is be the, a little bit later. Jane, I still want to load you this burden. I don't want to invite two ministers in a space of one hour. That privilege is only left to the president. He can invite several ministers in a space of one hour, but not me, Jane. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, good morning once again. Um, it's my singular honor and privilege uh, to invite the Honorable James Magode Queer, Minister of State for East African Community Affairs, who is representing the first deputy prime minister and Minister of ESC Community Affairs, um, Honorable James Magode Ikuya. But we also thank you so much for taking off time to come here 
and we also was just we would also like to request you uh, to convey our thanks to the first deputy prime minister and minister of es affairs for always always being there when we invite him invite her so honorable james magode queer the mic is yours thank you so much Executive Director of CETIN, members of Parliament present here, and all the various distinguished people in your protocols. Ladies and gentlemen, it befell me to represent the first deputy prime minister, who is also the minister of West Africa, because she's away on other duties elsewhere, and has therefore not been able to particularly grace this occasion. Therefore, when I was asked to represent her, and knowing the kind of people who are involved in this situation who are keen to us, who are, whom we are keen about East Africa, therefore I'm happy to be here to represent her. I was given a written speech which I could have read on her behalf, detailing all the various ideas and perspectives she wanted to convey to you. But unfortunately for me, my eyesight, I sort of lost my eyes when I was coming here because the glasses which I would have to, to use to glean some of the, the, speech, the, the, the writings there would, are not here. So instead of holding you, on to guessing what are these figures and figuring what is written, I just, you'll allow me to abstract and extract some of the highlights of our speech so that we can get going. The same message can be conveyed that way. It's not a matter of abusing our speech, but rather the misfortune of my disability at this time. Now, the very first thing I would like to dwell on is the fact that uh, you are talking of a budget framework, a pre, uh, I think post-budget dialogue for the, and, and connecting East Africa in particular. Of course, this is a, that is an interesting area of discussion. But I will not, will not go into the carpentry or the tapestry of that. How would you, how would you do it? What, because you are, you are normally the experts on that. My interest, however, is to mention key questions which what we are doing here should reflect so that they can achieve the overall objectives of integration. How we do it, the mannerism, the, the arithmetic, the chemistry and the physics of it, we'll leave that to you. But with us, we'll, 
we are looking at the fact that we want the people, African people want to integrate. Why do they want to integrate? In our concept, the key, the, 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 the real moti, mo, moving motive is to relink Africa to Africans. Because in the past, Africans were delinked from each other. First, we were delinked from the continent itself. We just existed on Earth, but not, we are not even the owners of the continent at one time. We are just strangers on a continent, delinked from the, your place where you are born. You exist on it, but linkage, how you, how you live and how you die, was decided by other people. It was not decided by us. Therefore, they had more access to things in Africa than we did. That's first. Link, the, uh, Africans were linked from even their own resources and continent. The second issue it meant that Africans were linked even from each other. They created states. The other day I was in, in, in Pondwe, which unfortunately which had, had the, this problem of killings of, of people in Kasese. The same people, you find him here, that one is called the, it was once in Bel Belgian Congo. And this side was the East Africa for the British. The British were not known to be neighbors of Belgians, were neighbors here in Africa. So they would be, they would be sitting at, watching each other from the side of, the, of Africa. They were neighbors. Meanwhile, Africans getting to Bunjubura, for example, from an African from Kampala, you needed to have to go to London first, then Brussels, in order to get to Bunjubura. That is as far as how Bunjubura became far from Africa, from Uganda. Yet it's just a throw, a distance throw away. So this question of linkages is a very important question. It's not just a contrived thing. We should not just look at it as an intellectual fascination which you are just coming up with, with the figures, what not. These are, these are ideals and aspirations which are basic to the existence of the African people. How can Bujumbura be very far from, from Kampara? And the others become foreigners and these are, they, they are the same breathing the same air, we are on the same lake, we are doing this. So this is where, why it became necessary in Africa that integration is a process for relinking Africans to each other. At that level, regardless of whether there are advantages of economy, what not, first, that we, we have the right to be, to be linked together. So that people, African people can begin getting each other, the values, the cultures, the other things. Of course, alongside that, you don't just eat cultures and whatnot. It's not just a manner, matter of seeing each other and the greeting. There are also economic issues. So naturally, if you are integrated economically, it makes sense. That's why these states, which we didn't create, but which were created, which we inherited, should be a basis of creating, recreating integration. They were not states which arose from Africans, but they were states which we inherited, but which you can now use as a stepping stone to gain back what we lost. That's why there is this integration of, of unity, of, of economies and the rest of things. So to us in East African community, for example, it makes therefore sense that because states must also be run, we needed the existing states themselves at the beginning of making the unit. The states must be run on some level of economy. Whether they like it or not, they must exist. Because the, the unit of Africa cannot exist without the, 
the interaction within, between these states. That's the beginning of it. So to, in order for that to enable them to exist, there must be financing, taxation, and the rest of the thing. And that's why they have those things. And around that, the fact that they must integrate, it's driving towards integration. You must therefore have harmonized taxation system. And we therefore we look at all things that can be harmonized. Already we agree that there are many things within the Treaty of East Africa we have which have indeed been harmonized. The, the, the minister here has been already indicating to us what has been the framework which has been agreed on taxation system. That's the basis for, for doing many things. So th that's already provided some harmony and we should be able, and I'm hoping that you are being together here now, is to examine exactly how that harmony is being visualized and actualized. Because if it is not done, then it becomes a, also a problem, and a problem on the existence of, 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 of these states. And the fact that the states themselves are starting not, not necessarily from the same ground. Some states have what you are coastal. They have big, big oceans around their borders and they have seas. And in terms of the economies of that, they are better off than those which are in the hinterland, squeezed in, in, in inside Africa like we are. Uh, but we can't claim rights on, 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 on the coastal areas because we didn't uh, create those states. So we are, we are, we are, we, we now we must have to, to, to agree that the other states are where they are. But apart from those, there are also the sizes of states. Some are small, others are big. And what now, now this difference of, of terrain in Africa tends also to create some conflict. The terrain, because you don't operate from, you don't start off from the same terrain. It's, it's even said that uh, when, when a he got, when a he got climbs, when a he got climbs on an ant hill, and looks in, looking at the other goats which are down there on the ground, it thinks it is off the ground. It stands there, swing, swing like it was the head of everything. So some of us are also like that. Given the, the, the terrain which is not the same, states which have better facilities sometimes have to be negotiated with in order to get things going. So we don't start from the same level. But those are the issues that must be harmonized as we're doing that. We must recognize that we start from different terrain, but the idea is to recreate a new Africa so that we get things going. So some, 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 of, some, some of the things are inadvertent. For example, Burundi is a small country, but it's a member of East African Unity. Uh, others are bigger countries. But when it comes to budgeting of East African community projects, you have got to negotiate. How, how do you do it? This small country, which is of, so many, of much less people, and that one is bigger, how, how do you relate? These relationships must be discussed and organized in the spirit of trying to, to, to bring uh, forward the unit. It's not so much haggling, oh, you are big, then you are, because if you don't haggle too much on that one, then you, the, even the basis of the unit that will, not, uh, will not exist. So the issue is we must have the spirit of trying to bring forward Africans together, but at the same time recognizing that we start, we operate from different terrain. And therefore, you are issues, you are the experts, you should be able to help us in judging these different terrain. Some shortfalls are not in the making of the states, as I was saying. There are also issues of policies, which may also cr create new problems. 
among us. Recently, we are hearing of attitude towards GMO crops in some countries can easily create how do we trade? You are, you, are, you, are, you are trying to have free trade in the area, free movement of goods, of people, and what? But if you, have, if you relate differently with other states, and then how will you relate internally with each other? All those issues must be analyzed and factorized. If you don't do so, we will we'll not be able to know. Therefore, in short, if there are any well wishes of, of Africa here, We should be able to see, to help us to resolve some sticking questions whenever they arise, especially, especially funding. We may not have the same ability, each state may not have the same ability as the other to fund, for example, the, the, the Secretariat of the ESC. So even if we are all, the body is willing, but the spirit, the spirit is willing, but the body cannot meet certain things. So what do we do? So that's why, that's why sometimes we must also depend on the well-wishers, the funders, to make, to always look at these shortfalls so that help us to iron them out in order to enable us to go over these phases which are difficult. But my, my conviction is that as Africa regains and starts coming together, they will discover in each other new strengths which can multiply our ability to resolve many other problems. And the more unity, therefore, we will have, the less areas of disharmony will, will, will arise. Because if, if, if the economies are integrated, then you no longer care about who, who owns the ports, who owns the coastal areas, who owns the lakes. The other day, we were having a problem one time when we were discussing the question of the lake. Lake Victoria, for example, is how much of it is owned by each, each of the countries. Now, if we begin quarreling about we want equalization and the ownership of lakes, you will not have a solution to, to the African problems. But if you agree on what you can use on the lakes together, it does not matter what sovereignty you have on the lake. You'll find that eventually the, 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 the lake serves all of, all, 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 every, everyone. The fish which, 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 is, which spawns in Uganda can be harvested in, in Kenya. Another one gets old in Tanzania, while another one gets born here. So, so you, you get those kind of things happening uh, once there is unity. But if there is a disunity, you will find then each, each border will, will want to construct a wall on the lake. To construct a wall on the lake, whether and how, how what, what will happen to Lake Victoria, I don't know. That will be a very, very big tragedy. That's why we must look. We have no way out except to look for the unity of East Africa. And that is what we in East African com, uh, community affairs are out for. And therefore, we encourage you in doing that. Uh, therefore, I'm happy to be here today to recognize my mission, sir, and wish you very good deliberation. Another round of applause for the Honorable Minister of State for East African Affairs. Honorable James Magode Kuya, thank you very much for carrying the message from uh, the Right Honorable First Deputy Prime Minister and Minister for East African Affairs and reminding us that this is not just about taxation but rather relinking Africans to Africans and to Africa. But because that process needs some money, that's when the taxation comes in. I want to recognize uh, Honorable Ongon, Ongom Silas member of parliament and uh, vice chairperson of parliamentary forum on East African affairs. You're welcome, sir. Uh, we want to move uh, faster. So I'm going to invite the following people to occupy the seats here. 
and be able to have a conversation uh, with a panel, from, through a panel. Uh, Mr. John Bosco Kalisa, are you around? Executive Director, East African Business Council. You can choose the seat that uh, serves you best. Uh, MS Jane Benuza, Benuza, Vice Chairperson, Uganda National Women Cross-Border Trade Cooperative. I hope your border still exists. There is a border we tried to close. It was bringing us problems. But you will tell us what exactly these conveniences do to trade when the borders are not safe. Uh, I want to invite uh, Mr. Leno Adwanyama, Regional Coordinator, East African Tax Governance, if you are in the house. I have some people who will be online. So you'll, you'll have the comfort. Um, let me invite Mr. Rukundo Solomon, Manager Taxation, Grand Thornton, Uganda. He's my auditor in another constituency, so me and him will settle matters later when he'll give me his opinion. In matters of audit, I thought a qualified opinion was something good. But they say when you have a qualified one, you have issues to answer. Who is here for Mr. Moses Kagwa? Susan, I think um, me and you may want to see each other if we don't see Mr. Kagwa in the house. Susan Nakagoro, you represent unless Mr. Kagwa has come or is coming. You can also take the seat now. We are combining both panels in your program. You possibly have two panels, but since others are online and we are short of time, we want to be able to run quickly through uh, this session and then you can also make your own submissions along the way. Madam Maris Wanyera, are you still with us? Come and accompany your colleague. This is a very nice panel with enough ladies and fewer men. So the men are now some endangered species. Can I find another man to add so that we can balance this bicycle? Uh, we will be joined by some people uh, online. Honorable, uh, I think, Odongo George will be coming in online. Or oh, if he doesn't, we shall question MTN and Airtel for failing him to come. Siatini, do I have any other panelists to join me? Or they will join me from the floor. You will send me the names, I will invite them. Just send me the names and then I will invite them. I still have two seats or one seat. At least I have one seat, which is not for me. But they will be coming in online, the two of them. And I will invite them when the time comes. Leonard Wanyama, I think, is online. Uh, so he will be joining us from his farm, and uh, his farm can be anything. He will tell us what that means, and I think Honorable Dongo will also be joining us online. Uh, let me begin off questions, just one or two minutes. You talk about yourself, maybe in one minute, and tell us what is it about debt and tax that we should know uh, from your position. You have the center stage, sir. One minute or two, and then we'll move into the substantive questions. Uh, good morning. Uh, first of all, allow me to register my appreciation to the organizer, Satini, and also appreciate the presence of the uh, ministers uh, from the ESC Affairs, uh, as well as the Minister of Finance, and uh, member of parliament present. I'm John Bosco Carissa, I'm the CEO of the South African Business Council. Uh, we are very, very, very grateful to uh, join uh, this panel in terms of talking about uh, taxation as well as debt management, uh, also building the resilience. Uh, the EABC is the regional apex, apex body for the private sector. We are the voice of the private sector in the ESC. Uh, we do a lot of advocacy. We do a lot of... Uh, uh, support in terms of business growth. So uh, this is a, a timely uh, discussion when we are talking about building resilience. Uh, you build resilience through supporting the, the private sector to, to recover from uh, what I always call three Cs, 
COVID uh, conflict and climate change. Those are very important aspects uh, with regard to economic recovery. And tax plays uh, a cardinal role in terms of our development agenda at the national level as well as the, at the regional level because it is through tax we are able to fund public goods. Uh, those are infrastructure, uh, health services, education, and other social related uh, services. So private sector uh, becomes a, a key partner in the, in the tax in taxation as well as uh, debt management, but also building the recovery. And uh, our view um, at EABC is that uh, we need to continue to enhance public-private dialogue. We need to deepen our engagement with the government. And I'm happy to say that um, when I looked at the budget, Uganda budget, 2023-2024, the inputs, synopsis input of the private sector are uh, well integrated within the budget. I was happy this morning when PSFU mentioned that their submission as the Minister of Finance, um, almost 78% uh, were fully taken on board in terms of uh, reflecting the interest and aspiration of the private sector. And I believe that also the, the voice of the citizen have been fully integrated within the budget. And that is the aspiration of the ESC. When you look at the treaty itself, the treaty is very clear that the integration of the ESC will be people-centered integration. When we talk about people-centered integration, we are talking about warfare enhancing. We, we measure it by the warfare of our people. And I was looking at the uh, African Environment Bank and uh, African Union report. ESC is the most integrated uh, regional communities among eight uh, recognized regional communities. And they looked at eight fundamental principles. And uh, you looked at the social integration aspect. You know, when you looked at the social integration aspect, ESC was rated almost, it got 90, 96% because we, are, we have not uh, uh, fully facilitated the movement of our people across the region, but at least we have an ESC passport. We have ID, national ID. People can use the national ID to move across the region. So there are some fundamental principles that uh, we've worked closely uh, with our government, and these fundamental principles are working. Having said that, there are issues that um, we, when we talk about the, uh, the taxation, I wanted to share with you that there are very important principles that we need to take into consideration. One is the aspect of simplicity simplest of our tax system, are they simple for the taxpayers? I think that is very critical. It is one of the canons of taxation, principles of taxation by Adam Smith. The tax should be simple to the taxpayers. And I, I was looking at the Singapore that you don't find the tax authority learning at you. You, you do your self-assessment. Okay? And if you have a challenge, the tax authority come to help you. So the, I think what we need to discuss is the level of compliance. And I'm happy the, uh, the commissioner uh, from the URA, every mentioned about digitization and in terms of engagement, constant engagement, constant engagement. And if, before even the budget is presented, I think the member of parliament are here, there is what we call citizen's budget, that the budget represents the views of the citizen. Have the citizen been consulted? So then it becomes very easy in terms of citizens implementing the same budget because they have been consulted during the budget process. So I think that is very important in terms of simplicity. Another aspect that I want to share with you is what we call certainty, predictability of the taxes. Are these tax measures um, uh, predictable? Because business community, again, we need to recognize that uh, we are in a global competition. Okay? If if uh, tax are very complex in nature, the business are very coward. They move to other uh, jurisdictions. They can move from Uganda and reallocate to Rwanda, reallocate to another country. I think that, abil uh, that ability of the tax to be certainty, be clear to the taxpayer is very important. The third aspect is what we call economy, and it is also part of the canon of taxation. The administration 
to manage the tax. You find that the, you are, and I was looking at the data and I, uh, I was uh, I generally shocked last night when I, uh, with all the efforts by the uh, URA, you find that the average contribution of the tax revenue from the Uganda are below the African average. Below the African average. That's a big point. Why? With all the efforts by URA, your tax contribution to GDP is less than 14 percent. Generally, and I looked at in 2010, you are almost hitting, uh, you are almost hitting 16 percent. You are reversing. What is happening? Then it means that the tax are being complex, and that is where you need we need to come uh, as the ESC. And I've been looking at the data even in Tanzania. We are growing more in formal sector than the formal sector. So what we need to do now with, in our discussion, what incentive, what mechanism can we deploy to gr graduate our informality to formality? What the tax plays a very important role. And this is where now we need to talk, how do we grow informality, the level of informality to formality? And the tax component has a very strong implication in terms of formalization of the business. And that is why we come to see how does the tax create incentive for MSMEs, that is micro, small, or medium enterprise, to graduate? And I looked at also one of the challenges has been the access to patient capital. Our banks, I saw, I saw Uganda government banks and others, when you talk to the business community, they say banks here, they are, it's very hard, the interest rate is very, very punitive, uh, tax measures are very punitive. So we cannot grow the business, we cannot talk about recovery when we don't ensure that uh, the, finance, uh, the, the financial instrument, uh, instruments for SMEs to grow and thrive are in the place. I had a discussion last week, I was here in Uganda, with East African Development Bank, and I asked them, this is the bank that, that, that is supposed to fuel the growth of East Africa. And they told me they have instruments, but they are redundant within our banks in Uganda. So I said, why? Well, the bank is there, they have all the funds, but these funds cannot be, access, cannot be accessed by SMEs. So I realized that there is what we call information asymmetry. Eh? And this is where we need to come, Seatini, East African Business Council, PSF, you. We need to address issue of information asymmetry with regard to both debt sustainability, with regard to both tax harmonization, with regard to economic recovery. Otherwise, we will not be able to grow um, our business if we still have those daunting challenges. Thank you very much. Thank you for your submission. Let me ask you to just, okay. I want to go to the extreme end, Madam Jane Benuza. Uh, you represent the women uh, in cross-border trade issues. We want to hear from you how the women have taken advantage of the opportunities and the regional integration and whether we are actually addressing the challenges, whether the tax amendments presented have addressed the challenges that are being faced there and any other thing that you may want to, to share with the meeting. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, in fact, I'll talk briefly about cross-border trade. Then I'll talk about the opportunities of simplified trade. Uh, then I'll talk about the opportunities of the one-stop border post. Then <laughs> I'll go to the challenges. Then I'll talk about the effects of COVID-19 and then uh, some of the recommendation and way forward. Uh, before I talk about the cross-border trade, I'll first uh, compliment the the East African Community Trademark, ERC, uh, Uganda Export Promotions Board, Seatin, and you will. Those people have made us who we are because at least they have moved these cross-border women traders to an extra mile. Uh, by the way, when I talk of cross-border trade, it started in 2010 as, as informal with the support from Uganda Export Promotions Board and the ESC to provide space 
listen and amplify women's voice while working with the other, other stakeholders. ERC and Uganda Export Promotion Board, their active engagement was to advocate or advocacy issues and the articulation of women's rights, concern and empowerment or empowering women cross-border traders in the East African community. Cross-border traders or trade constitutes a significant percentage of informal and formal traders, mainly dealing in this type of food, commodities like maize, beans, bananas, pineapple, etc. And this has a direct impact on food security in the region. Majority of rural and urban dwellers engage in this trade as a form of employment and the livelihood strategy. However, women in cross-border trade faces unique challenges in the course of transacting business in spite of the contribution they bring to the economy and the knowledge on the benefits of the integration. Uh, when I talk of the benefits cross-border trader, traders or cross-border trade, has benefited from simplified trade regime. I may not stop, but let me just talk about the few. Uh, first of all, the construction of the, of the OSPB, where women have a desk and a resources center or information resource center, has done a lot, at least to make these women improve their awareness as far as the trade is concerned. As far as taxation and the uh, knowledge about the integration or the ESC integration. Import duty exemption for the goods below 2,000 US and, and the certificate of origin. In fact, we have benefited a lot when we are exempted from the import duty. Those are some of the benefits. Self-declaration. Uh, women cross-border traders are now allowed to declare their consignments by themselves without a clearing agent. Uh, another opportunity for the construction of the one-stop border post was to reduce time and cost of trade by operating under single window, provision of women desk, uh, provision of a URA custom women official to handle women issues. Because sometimes you know that women are a bit inferior. When they look into some uh, men's faces, sometimes they fear. That's why URA decided to give us uh, an official who is a woman who can handle women issues. And we compliment you for that. Thank you so much. Yeah, the adoption of women cross-border traders on border joint committees, the, J the JBCs, at least we can sit on that forum and then give out our issues and uh, maybe assist our fellow women who are doing trade and give them information. There is a gap which was bridged between the border agencies with the women cross-border traders, because now we are having a good working relationship with all the border agencies, because previously we used to fear the customs, uh, thinking that it's for, the, for the, these big, big consignments and maybe uh, people who speak a lot of English. So at least we have got that good working relationship with those people. Uh, we benefited from the OSPB because we, they gave us, or they provided, they provided us with a storage facility where we can store our, our products before clearing them. Uh, there is access to information. At least we can access the information concerning trade and taxation. 
uh, there is an opportunity, okay, the opportunities of OSPB and the simplified trade regime improve the competitiveness and the confidence among women cross-border traders to formalize and expand their businesses. Because most of, uh, of our borders uh, have got, uh, have formalized. We have cooperatives and we can work together. There is increased awareness on rights and obligation of traders. There is registration. Okay, we registered our cooperatives, as I told you, uh, on at least the six border borders where ESC operates, and uh, the registration of women cross-border traders union, because we wanted even to share these opportunities with our fellow women traders at the national level, because at least we have we have uh, the the borders or grassroots has been exhausted. So this year we registered uh, the Uganda Women Cross Border Traders Union also to handle the issues at the national level. However, we are having some challenges. <coughs> Most of the women cross border traders are traders not by choice, but are compiled by the need of the need to earn a living and they feed their families. Informal cross-border traders or trade is characterized by many risks and challenges that mostly affect women. These are some of the challenges. Harassment by impersonators. According to the structures of our OSPBs, at the entries, you find that there is a lot of people who call themselves a lot of names and maybe these people uh, divert our women traders in, and get some money from them, calling themselves uh, police officers, some customs officers. So you feel like a lady from uh, deep, deep in the village cannot access uh, the service because of these impersonators. Uh, most of the women cross-border traders, sorry, uh, and harmonized policies in the region. I think this has been our song always. We've been singing this song now and then. I don't know whether through this budget uh, the, 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 the policies will be harmonized because what I know the policy makers are not the implementers. We are the implementers, like how Mr. Kalisa has brought it. Uh, the policies are made Without even, the without even consulting the, the implementers. So we are forced to implement the policy we never contributed to. That is a very big challenge to us. There is a lack of banks on some borders. An example in Mutukula, we don't have any bank, which makes our business a bit complex moving long distances to Chotera, maybe uh, Masaka, to access the banks. The cost of transaction becomes big, mostly on mobile uh, banking and the mobile money, because since we don't have banks, we use the mobile, uh, the, 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 the mobile money, whatever. So as if I've had something to do with the, with the mobile banking. But I've heard that there is also another 10% withholding, which is uh, imposed on them. Yet we are, we are praying that it should be uh, brought down. But uh, I, I know that the technical people will work on it. Exchange rate infrastructure, this one is also affecting us. And to make things worse, we are dealing in, the, in Uganda currents. When it comes to taxes, we, we are being calculated in the U.S. and we follow the, the, that very day's exchange rate. Because whenever we do the transaction, they consider the exchange rate of U.S. dollar on that very day. The URA will give us highlights on that uh, because it's always like that at the border. Another challenge is uh, uh, is, uh, is talk the walk. 
I don't know whether what we say is exactly what we do, because there is a lot of talking and less implementation. There is also another challenge of language barrier. The budget is in English, and I don't know whether uh, people at the grassroots, all of them do understand this language. Uh, so I think that's why we don't really understand the budget. We can't interpret. Uh, for us, we just uh, hear uh, the, 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 the techniques of the budget. We don't really understand. We would do pray that uh, the budget should also be simplified like other, other things so that even my grandmother can understand what really is meant by the budget without, if, without finding someone to interpret for us the budget. Uh, there is a high taxation, tax te high taxation in the name of protecting our domestic industries. <laughs> this one is bothering us a lot, we traders, because we don't know all about, it, about it, protecting our domestic what industries. A trader where there is a demand, where there is a high profit, that's where we go. And, uh, and maybe we should do look into the industries you are telling us to protect. What do they produce? If they produce things that will convince me as a trader, I will automatically go there. Take an example, you will never see me going for Renzo water because I'm satisfied with it. I will never go for Mukwano because I'm satisfied with Mukwano. But when I go for something, let it come in, and then the, the, the industries ask themselves, why is it that the trader is concentrating on this than this one? It means that there is a question mark with this product. So you allow us bring that product, then our industries buy the, that product and see why is it that the customers need this, then they will work on that. And then we will, we will protect our what? Our markets, other than restricting us, imposing high taxation on us, on the products that we are not satisfied with. So I think we should look into that. Uh, poor cooperation among the partner states. This one, most of us who stay at the border, we have experienced it a lot because it affects us, we traders. These are our areas of interest. This is where we carry our businesses from. Take an example, Pondre, I will never go back there because there is, there, there is a, some insecurity. However much, it's, it's also another challenge we are facing. I will not go to Sudan to take my consignment there because I'm not safe there. Let the, 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 the partner states harmonize that to make trade uh, more flexible for us traders. Uh, poor road network. Hope that's the last one. Yeah, They're good. interesting, but uh, we want to give time to others as well. Okay. Okay, for me I was told to give challenges and we have as many as possible and these people need to hear those challenges. We are going to take your written <laughs> submission and hand it over. Okay, to insecurity, then the policy makers and uh, whatever. Let me talk about the effects of COVID-19. Close of borders lead to collapse of businesses, mostly for women cross-border traders. Then restrictions of movement, raised maternity newborns because uh, you know the only thing we could do is moving around, around the house and, the, and then going to the bedroom and then we make children. So the, the <laughs> and this one increased the uh, newborn and child maternity, whatever. And then most of the burden was given to the women, because you know you, you our husbands, when it comes to, to the children, then there is a challenge of, uh, there is a challenge of uh, uh, gender basic violence, which is still going on up to now. 
and then there is uh, debts, as they've been talking about. It's also affecting us. The business collapsed. We had borrowed money, and uh, and some of our members are still in prison because they are still paying. Now, talking briefly about the recommendation, because you would love to hear what we feel like. Just be quick. Yes, I will be minute. quick. I will be quick. <laughs> uh, we would recommend our government to think of the dynamics in trade policies and the other policies in East Africa and the continental. Currently in Mutukula, Tanzania, Tanzania has closed some of, of the products that are coming to Uganda out of blue without traders concern. So I don't know whether that policy, at least they would have uh, explained or they would have given us notes before they close because we traders are working, are working under contracts. I may be having a contract of 10 or at least 30 metric tons from Tanzania. Now out of blue, the border is closed. They don't allow us to bring our products. So I think that should be a thought of the structure shift, which will impact women and men differently. This is due to the fact that women have different constraints, as you know, as far as economic, political, and social and culture. So they should also think about that. Engage grassroots pattern, uh, participation in a policy formalization and implementation, because we are the implementers. Then do more sensitization, support, supervision, monitoring, and evaluation. Uh, the government officials do less monitoring and uh, supervision. That's why you hear or you see things um, going wrong down there. Because if at least they increase on that, it would be okay. Support access to credit facilities for small scale traders. At least the ESA has done that and we have to, uh, to compliment them. They've, uh, they've put out a women's bank which will assist women without collaterals and uh, whatever to borrow money and then support their businesses. Uh, address insecurity, insecurity issues across borders like Impondre and Elegu. Then rethink on the taxation on mobile money and banking transaction to enable digital financing. Partner states should harmonize policies on various areas of cooperation, and then thinking of having a product, a product hub for agricultural products, because we are facing a problem in sorting. Whenever we have uh, some consignments, take an example of avocado, taking it outside, they always uh, they give us that we need this size, we need this size, so we need at least an agricultural hub which will assist us. Thank you so much. Thank you, Madam Benoza, bringing the issues that affect a very critical constituency, the women trading across the border. I, I, I just really will be happy to receive your submission in writing. I hope Siatin will get that. These are critical issues that need to be discussed as we go into implementation of the new year. I have two people online, and uh, I left Irene to be seated there because she needs to take notes. She will have a few things to answer. Otherwise, it was supposed to be on my panel, but my panel doesn't have a table that she's used to. So Irene, stay where you are. You will be answering some questions possibly at the end in case any are turning up for you. Are the people online ready? I have uh, Flavia. Flavia Businge. If it is possible to bring her up, she could uh, give us her submission. If not, I will be uh, moving on in the meantime. Yep. Yes, Flavia. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I don't know the situation if I would just react on that, what has been submitted by Madame representing the cross border traders. She has highlighted quite a number of issues, and uh, 
we also acknowledge that uh, the small and medium enterprise contribute quite a lot in uh, our business in the economies of East Africa. And uh, largely, they, it, uh, the SMEs do contribute about 90%. We do acknowledge that in the business and 80% uh, on employment. However, they do face quite a lot of challenges, as has been highlighted. But at the community level, we have uh, undertaken quite a number of uh, initiatives to ensure that some of those challenges are addressed, particularly relating to development of uh, policies that uh, mitigate uh, the trade barriers that affect uh, cross-border trade and uh, low productivity, some of which are uh, bringing out uh, the ESC charter on SMEs and uh, industrial development strategies that we have come up uh, at the ESC level and uh, other uh, framework to catalyze technological development and innovations. Uh, we have also tried to support the formalization of informal sector by providing certain incentives. I think she spoke so well in regard to uh, the, the simplified trade regime and what it has done to the cross-border uh, communities, which is really good. And uh, we, I heard uh, Madam Commissioner URA talk about uh, the authorized economic operator program, but to support the women and youth or the SMEs, we have also developed uh, what we called the light benefits for the SMEs to benefit from the authorized economic operator program and also um, brought in about uh, financial support. We've been engaging the East African Development uh, Bank for purposes of providing uh, financial facilities that can benefit uh, the, the women and youth uh, or the uh, SMEs generally. Um, we undertook capacity building uh, to make sure that we create awareness on some of the policies that exist but particularly, we go to what we call the social protection to promote decent workers. Uh, as we said, we know that uh, SMEs contribute quite a, a bigger number of employment, and therefore, we believe that they also have to be health in nature. And therefore, uh, they, uh, there are some countries that are already providing uh, health insurance schemes for small and medium, for example, Tanzania and Rwanda. Also, to we have uh, uh, engaged for purposes of reducing cumbersome registration procedures and also access to infrastructure. Uh, Madam said uh, there is an issue of infrastructure, much as we have OSBPs, but we still <clears throat> have challenges in that area. But also uh, coming to what is uh, currently um, uh, facilitating, or rather what is trending today, we, we have managed to develop policies that uh, um, allow access to energy, uh, to uh, energy, uh, to diversify the sources like uh, wind, solar, geothermal, and biogas, and encouraging cross-border trade in renewable energy. So we know that electricity is quite uh, expensive, and therefore we look for other initiatives that can be slightly cheaper to facilitate production of. Uh, or, or on such matters that uh, facilitate cross-border trade. We, we, we can also talk about um, the recent harmon uh, revised uh, uh, CET and also the budget that was uh, uh, that is being uh, developed for implementation by 1st of July. If you look at some of the, the areas for protection that have been uh, uh, mentioned, we look at that there are certain protections that have been given to commodities that are mostly accessible to the uh, East Africans and also those that are dealt with by the medium and uh, small and medium enterprises, including women, to do with the agriculture. I think Uganda has done it very well because they have uh, protected their potatoes, peas, vegetable. Uh, the minister mentioned quite a number of them. And I know very well that uh, women are very good in such a uh, in such areas, um, we, 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 we believe that uh, also in terms of uh, um, the harmonization that she has also talked about, you very well know that currently there is uh, an ongoing process for tax harmonization. 
And uh, of course, it has been a little bit slow, but then uh, progress has been uh, has been made, and uh, we can talk about uh, the partner states having developed uh, detailed proposals for excise uh, tax rates and uh, tax uh, base plus VAT income, and uh, now we are having uh, council directives to have those procedures uh, adopted by November 2022, 2023, this year. Uh, regarding the exchange rates too high, as she has uh, mentioned, we also have a process under, uh, going on of uh, a monetary union. It's quite also uh, a process, but we believe that once it comes on board, we shall have reduced uh, rates, exchange rates across the borders, and also um, uh, allowing, uh, facilitating trade. Uh, we, 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 we believe that uh, in terms of technological exchanges, there, there is a lot of work that has been done, trade facilitation initiatives that uh, been, have been undertaken, and also um, research and uh, development uh, te and technological transfers that we intend to bring to our uh, small and medium enterprises. Uh, allow me to just uh, uh, end there in terms of uh, reacting to what has been submitted by the cross-border. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you, Flavia. People wanted to see your face. We don't know whether it is the video or the face. That is the problem, but uh, we'll do that later on. You may want to well appreciate. Oh, yes, there she is. Just in case you meet her on the street, uh, don't say you don't know her. She's given us very good insights uh, from the ESC uh, Director Customs and Trade at the ESC Secretariat. Thank you very much, Flavia. I want to move on to Susan. Susan is my nearest neighbor here. And uh, the last I heard, Susan was working with the tax policy issues. What are the issues there? You, you have some time to tell us. I'm giving you a blank check. Uh, thank you, Dr. Fred Mumza. Uh, my name is Susan Nakagolo. First of all, I need to say that I'm holding portfolio. My boss is on my way. So I take this opportunity away as a way to express myself. And uh, <laughs> I'm a principal economist in the Department of Tax Policy. I have handled quite a number of issues, ESC. Uh, I've done revenue analysis. Now I'm handling indirect taxes, specifically excise duties. And uh, I just want to also say that I represent the women in the ministry because I'm a focal person for the women desk. So I, that's very critical. There are not many people who represent women issues. So uh, moving to the subject, first of all, as a, to a policy maker, I just want to let you know that where we are today, we are in a difficult position, considering what is happening on inter in the international scene. Even the giants have fallen. We have seen the Ghanaian economy, for instance, even within East Africa, for instance, some of our colleagues used to have quite high, impressive tax GDP ratios. Uh, recently, we are all coming down. I think we are in the range of 11 to 15, if I'm not mistaken. So it is quite a challenging situation for a tax policy maker like me to make a contribution. In other words, for, for us to raise enough money to sustain our economy within what we are experiencing today, not to mention the exogenous factors, the likes of the Ukraine war, the likes of the post-COVID, we should be giving industries stimuluses or stimulus packages, but we are not, so to say. So we cannot milk the cow excessively. And I say that with passion, because I know it's not easy. Yet, at the same time, we have to raise revenue. As you heard recently, during the budget, actually the president challenged us on the, the tax GDP ratio. But at the same time, I was concerned about how much money we are spending 
on external financing. So it's a paradox, so to say. But that notwithstanding, I must say that we are here because of ESC, so I must also speak to it. We have undertaken decisions as far as the, the EAC purview is concerned, and the, the protocol compels us. I, I'm, I'm aware that the treaty, Article 83, undertook, and my boss comes, so I'll summarize, <laughs> undertook to harmonize, no say you're coming, to harmonize domestic taxes, and the, the rationale is to ensure that. <laughs>